<laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for your patience. We are in truly an ivory tower of a church, and it was a little bit difficult for everybody to find the space. So thank you again for, for coming. I'd like to welcome everybody who's here in person and then all of you who are joining online. We have quite an international audience today. Um, we're, so my name is Holly Johnson, and I am the Associate Director of Global Freedom of Expression, which is an initiative here at Columbia that seeks to advance international norms on jurisprudence related to freedom of expression globally. And um, we are joined here today by some a very old friend of ours, Professor um, Father Jordy. And this is really in recognition of the launch of his new book, The Collapse of Freedom of Expression, Reconstructing the Roots of Modern Liberty. And he did quite a bit of his research on this book here at Columbia back in 2017. So joining us today is Michael Schudson, who was his advisor during his stay here, and then also Professor Richard John next to me here. Uh, Father, um, sorry, not Father John, but Richard John uh, had a reading group at that time that Father Jordy joined in on. So this conversation today is very much a continuation of the dialogues that were started uh, some six or so years ago. So for the format for today, Father Jordy is going to open with a short presentation, outline the main points of his book, and then after that, I will do my best to facilitate a question about some of the main themes in the book. And the chat is open, so we encourage everybody who's joining us online to post any questions or comments. And we're going to reserve 30 minutes at the end for those questions. A colleague of mine here will read them out once we, we get to that point. So by way of a very brief introduction, I wanted to share some quotes from the foreword by John Durham Peters. Peters writes, in its critical appreciation and reconstruction of the Anglo-American tradition of thinking about free speech, the book celebrates what the liberal tradition offers at its best, a vision of free speech as a human good. Further, Father Geordi's account of the sources and ends of free speech assess the confusions and commotions of our digital moment, and is at once informative, compelling, and wise. The world would be a better place if we all heeded its teachings. So I think I'm just going to formally introduce everybody so you've got a sense of everyone's background because we are an interdisciplinary group. And then we will hand the floor to Father Jordi. So Father Jordi is Associate Professor of Media Ethics and Media Law at the School of Church Communications at the Pontifical University of Santa Croce in Rome. He's originally from Barcelona, Spain, and has a master's degree in law from the University Autonoma de Barcelona and has earned a PhD summa cum laude in moral theology from the Pontifical University of the Holy Cross in Rome. In 2016 and 2017, he was a visiting research fellow at the Center for Ethics and Culture at the University of Notre Dame, a visiting scholar at Columbia's Graduate School of Journalism, and a visiting scholar at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard. His work focuses on transparency and church communications, privacy, digital identity and data protection, ethical dilemmas related to freedom of expression in Europe and the United States, and the challenges of exercising freedom of expression online. Michael Schutzen is a professor of journalism here at Columbia, and he specializes in the history of communications and trends in journalism. He's the author of 11 books and co-editor of four others concerning the history and sociology of the American news media, advertising, popular culture, Watergate, and cultural memory. He's a recipient of a number of honors. He has been a Guggenheim Fellow, a resident fellow at the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences, Palo Alto, and a MacArthur Foundation Genius Fellow. His most recent books include The Rise of the Right to Know, Why Journalism Still Matters, and Journalism Why It Matters. So, and next to me is Professor John. He's a historian who specializes in history of business, technology, communications, and American political development. His publications include many essays, eight edited books, and two monographs, which include Spreading the News, the American Postal System from Franklin to Morse. And that book received several national awards. Uh, the second is an 
Network Nation, Inventing American Telecommunications. He was awarded a Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship for his research on the history of American anti-monopoly thought. So I think we have lots of great talent here to discuss some of these issues. And with that, I give the floor to Father Jordi. Thank you so much, Holly, for your kind words and for hosting this event. It is tremendous, it's a tremendous honor to be at Columbia again, where this project grew through meaningful academic conversations and many hours at the Butler Library. <laughs> the global freedom of expression is a number one hub for all scholars that study free speech. And I admire the work that you do here and the leadership of President Bollinger, a champion of free speech, as we all know. Before starting my talk, I'd like to thank the School of Communications in Rome for the priceless support of the Dean and colleagues and students as well. Santa Croce is also global, but in a different, in a different way than Colombia is. I would like to thank the amazing scholars, I mean, Michael and Richard, and Holly, but also Andy. They were listening to me six years ago, you know, in a Alex was there as well in a seminar, you know, starting to, you know, trying to figure out what I was thinking about free speech. And that was the moment of Milo Yiannopoulos, you know, and all the problems at Berkeley. So, however, I think that the project or my thoughts have matured a bit more since then. So thank you for being here and also to Amel and the guys at the PhD program at the J School for helping figure this out. So my warmest gratitude for being here today. This book is a fruit of almost 10 years of research in Rome, Notre Dame, and Columbia, and Harvard. It has an intended multidisciplinary approach to tackle the key aspects of the exercise of expression. Ultimately, the tolerance of harmful speech and its limits. I examine the sustainability of the building of freedom of expression and what threatens its edifice, the restrictions and the compulsions, and how the different schools of thought have answered to this problem of tolerance of harmful expression, how liberals, communitarians, libertarians, critical race theory, feminists, all of them have a point. The thesis of this book is that the liberal tradition of freedom of expression was built upon legal and moral foundations that were borrowed from an inherited tradition based on Christianity, Greek philosophy, and Roman law that has been taken for granted. Modernity disregarded these roots to build a new order that was needed and redefined many key concepts under this new paradigm, a new idea of man, an autonomous, autonomous man, and freedom, but also a new reshaped con notion of law and justice with its moral and legal positivism. As a Harvard Law professor, Adrian Vermeul puts it, the law has officially disavowed is its own classical heritage but in practice draws upon and develops it, all while afflicted by an, an strange amnesia. This is one of the, the amnesia is one of the things that I think is behind some of the problems that we are facing now. Modernity constructed something new, but de facto lived out of an inherited ethos. These traditional foundations were taken for granted for centuries. Now, in our contemporary world, with the anxiety of deep fakes, public shame, etc., the free speech rationale seems to be without convincing response to those who suffer the consequences of the most harmful speech. And in front of the trend of cancellations or the new school censorship, it seems unable to foster freedom of expression. To reflect on freedom of expression, I've chosen the language of architecture, as Milton did, on purpose, 
not the language of of economy as the anti-monopoly expert here on my side so the the language of architecture uh, on purpose because free speech is a crucial building for public life for public conversation for democracy but a particular sensitive one is solid and fragile at the same time and I'll be, I'll be examining a bit its origins and construction. No? I examined the architects of the project, liberal architects as Milton, Locke, Mill, between the 17th and 19th centuries, which borrowed most of the constructive materials from the cultural traditions that we mentioned before to build its political project. The liberal project of public freedoms has two main traditions, one in Europe and the one in the United States, both a product of the two liberal revolutions with very different historical background, philosophy, and legal approaches. I also show the main critiques against liberalism because it's always wise to hear what the others say about you and the criticisms you learn. And from the main school of thought, what libertarians say about liberalism and communitarians and the critical race theory and feminists, they all have a point that show how some postulates have proven to be defective building material, which jeopardize the stability of the edifice. The structure, the, the principles of the free speech liberal tradition is grounded in some important pillars, separation of church and state, the creation of the secular public sphere, the institution of power to secure in inalienable rights. The book identifies the deficiencies inherent in the European Enlightenment paradigm that weaken the foundations of freedom of expression and explain the cracks that threaten its strength. The European Enlightenment separated freedom and tolerance from their natural allies, which are truth and good, to base them on an ethical relativism. It adopted legal positivism as the definitive solution, but its purview is limited because abuse of expression is also a moral question. The proposed neutrality of the public sphere turns out to be fictitious. Liberalism requires suspending moral judgment, but in fact has its own idea about men and this force. The crisis of truth that caused concern for a good part of modernity has had many consequences, including the mere formal use of words and concepts. This has protected opportunists who use free speech in an abusive way. This course has been understood as something uniform when it is not. A piece of news is different from a piece of propaganda or poetry. There are different types of discourse with its own grammar of use. For many speech theorists, only actions can produce objective harm. Anything else constitutes subjective offense. Mm -hmm. But if words don't mean anything, then anything goes. And faced with the real harm caused by abuses of expression, the liberal formula suggests more speech as the only solution without providing justice for the damaged caused. In this way, public speech becomes a kind of pitched battle in which he who yells louder has more influence and power and he who imposes his view with violence wins. I criticize I'm in favor of free speech, but I criticize this narcissistic notion of freedom of expression that some use or abuse, because I consider that the original notion of free speech was not coined to be a self-affirmation. So the threats to the integrity of this building are due some to external agents as bad weather, no, or, or also and others as internal ones, as flaws that create crevices and fractures. I'm talking about suppression, 
and compelled speech that are the two main threats. In the networked public sphere, the new governors of the internet that are the big tech platforms are deciding heavily on speech, not only through content moderation, but through algorithmic bias and opaque policies. The other, the other major threat comes from different fanaticisms and intolerant factions, religious and secularists, that try to ban or compel speech in the name of their orthodoxy. The fight among orthodoxies is not new in the public sphere. It's natural, and I would say even healthy. The danger is the state, is the state taking sides, changing the original plan of a pluralistic of a pluralist coexistence. And preservation, preservation over time and maintenance of a building is key. In Rome is one of our key defects, I would say. And if there's no preservation, then you admire ruins of the past. So the perennial key question of free speech is tolerance of harm. To which point should we tolerate it? The general legal limits of public order and public morality have been a shared common boundary, a system based on tolerating a certain degree of evil is uncertain, but astute and wise. And it worked well when there was a shared ethical common ground. From the moment that those working for contemporary freedom of speech understood transgression as an end in itself, and defended free speech as a right to offend, as the self-affirmation of the individual, tolerance became a refuge from which to harm others with impunity. Milton, Mill, and the framers did not consider free speech as a weapon to be used to harm others. Transgression is positive and is needed, but free speech is not a weapon. Overextension of its principles makes free speech theory unsustainable. Robert Post has talked about this in a very deep way and inspiring. Progressives imposing equity are using the same blueprint as populists on the right. As a Stanford professor Michael Mac McConnell says, in the case of liberalism, this is not merely overextension. It is inversion. Those no, illiberal tendencies, you remember that cover of the Economist talking about the liberal tendencies. However, when government insists that all citizens be neutral, tolerant, and egalitarian, McConnell says, it ceases to be liberal government. The book has this part of diagnosis and seeing um, analysis of this. And then a final one on where I suggest re how could we rebuild. The book is intended to be, as it has said before, a recognition of the success of some of the institutions of the classical liberal architects, such as Milton, Mill, Locke, no? And a call to refurbish the liberal building of freedom of expression, acknowledging the soundness of an inherited tradition. And Two of the main things that I'm suggesting there is the rebuilding, rebuilding the notions of tolerance and objective harm. I suggest using Cohen Almagor's extension of the harm principle in conjunction with the rules of the philosophy of language to identify abusive uses of speech. Philosophy of language, it can be helpful to distinguish between satire and gratuitous, gratuitous insult. There are discursive actions, you know, speech acts, that are not expressions of ideas, but exaltations of insult or mockery. There are fraudulent uses of expression that violate the internal grammar of each type of speech. I think that the wisdom of theology studying human intentionality, it's also helpful to unmask instrumentalizations of speech as refuge. Sometimes you hear free speech opportunists saying, I didn't intend to offend. But in expressive acts, we cannot separate voluntary, voluntary hum human action 
from its intent. We cannot separate the ends from the means since they are united in the person. So my point about the system of free speech is that it's built in an unstable balance of contrary forces. It's never fully solved. Free speech can be instrumentalized, weaponized. The temptation to solve the problem is to regulate all behavior and prevent all harm. This is not possible. Free speech has not an easy fix, lives in a permanent unsteadiness. Tolerance of evil and error requires moral and legal deliberation. John Peters said, moral and legal gymnastics. Freedom of expression has a complexity that prevents it from being governed by a comprehensive system of rules. It will never be the ultimate solution to rule. As in the construction of any building, contrary forces are key elements in the stress resistance of, a, of any material. The wear and tear of the weather or the vibrations of a subterranean train test the building. The law, philosophy of language, moral theology give complementary reasons for a solution that will never be definitive. I suggest that we explore a new paradigm of global law following Professor Domingo's proposal that is inspired by inherited legal traditions from the Roman Jus Gentium and the medieval Jus, Communio, Jus Comune and with elements of international law forged in the Enlightenment. With the internet, hateful, hateful speech is no longer a problem at the level of national sovereignty. It's a global program, problem. The contents of violence, hate, and pornography moderated by digital platforms are inhumane and unfair everywhere. But the public conversation of billions of citizens cannot be decided by non-transparent values and a team of anonymous moderators. The common ground that I suggest comes also from recuperating the sense of morality and the sacred. I'm sympathetic with John Peters' view on this. He says, belief is public and we enact our beliefs in all that we do, even if you are a Christian or a devout atheist. We all enable our beliefs in the way we behave, in the way we act. And reason operates in many tongues. Truth is symphonic. The notion of freedoms as human goods is also orchestral. There's also harmony among human goods. That's why conflicts between rights, I, I mean, I acknowledge that they, they are unavoidable, but the need to prioritize rights is different than pitting them against each other, as has been done by setting those who defend free speech in the name of freedom in opposition to those who do it in the name of equality. There was an objective moral foundation of rights that has been removed. When there are no universal foundations, the priorities easily vanish. Finally, I will conclude using the language of architecture again. Free speech is a crucial building for public life and democracy. We said a particularly sensitive one, solid and fragile. I find Venice a metaphor of what I'm trying to say. The very idea of Venice, a city unique for its elegance and beauty, but built in one of the least suitable places, <laughs> a lagoon with no rock, but only sand. In fact, the discovery that tree trunks completely submerged in mud did not corrode, but could give stability to the heavy buildings above, allowed this brave city republic to achieve immense splendor. The building of free speech itself can be seen as built on logs immersed in the mud, like the rest of the city. This metaphor gives us a strong message about the paradoxical weakness and strength of free speech. The relational fragility of humankind expressed in the pluralist 
exercise of freedom can become a solid foundation for life for the city if we immerse it in the solid moral and legal inherited foundations thank you so much for your patience mm -hmm. thank you so much brother jordi so the the first question we wanted to kind of tackle is kind of assessing some of the shifts that are taking place in the United States. Uh, the U.S. has some of the strongest protections for freedom of expression globally, thanks to the First Amendment. And periodical surveys from the Knight Foundation and Gallup show that Americans are supportive of free speech principles. But in recent years, there's been an increase in restrictions on free speech at universities in the form of disinvitations or cancellations of speakers. There's now trigger warnings, and there have been even book bans in schools and libraries across the country. We have the rise of the so-called cancel culture. So how can we explain this paradox, this shift in attitudes that is taking place in, in the U.S. right now? Michael, would you like to, to start? Do you have some thoughts on that? Uh, yes, I have some thoughts. First, thank you, uh, Dr. Jordy, for uh, the book, <clears throat> which I'm still in the midst of, um, in, in fact, was just opened into a section this morning on the, the famous uh, Colorado case of the the, uh, the birthday cake. Yeah. Um, uh, and I didn't realize, I don't think I ever knew, that there were so many different judgments uh, about it at the time. Um, um, I, I, I won't go into the, the, the whole instance, but um, but there it was freedom of religion uh, uh, opposed to freedom of expression, or at least that's one re way of reading it. Um, and these things that the First Amendment uh, held together, thought it held together, can under other circumstances, as the world grows, the social world grows more diverse than it once was, uh, that is more things once regarded as um, uh, unacceptable ways of life had become, at least in many quarters, although not all quarters, uh, acceptable uh, um, modes of living. Um, and that raises conflicts, conflicts we hadn't imagined. Um, now, I, I, I'm, I think I'm probably going to dodge uh, Holly's question here, but I wanted to, um, I was reading, um, I, I went to see what one of my favorite sources would have to say about um, free expression. So I went to Wikipedia, of course. And there's actually a quite, I think it's quite an interesting um, entry on freedom of speech. Uh, and it lists the boundaries. Uh, and it's it's mostly talking about the US, I think, um, although not exclusively. But it says that there are common limitations or boundaries to freedom of speech that relate to, here's the list, libel, slander, obscenity, pornography, sedition, mm -hmm incitement, fighting words, hate speech, classified information, copyright violation, trade secrets, food labeling, non-disclosure agreements, the right to privacy, dignity, the right to be forgotten, public security, and perjury. Probably could have gone on, but um, so now okay. some of those are not so important in the US, um, right to be forgotten, say, um, although we may be dealing with it. Um, and some of those did not become important until the 20th century, uh, food labeling. I don't know when non-disclosure agreements uh, arise. Um, but uh, within, no one has repealed the First Amendment. Um, uh, it, it still exists. We still pay it honor. Um, but we have all kinds of laws that uh, limit um, free expression. Uh, 
uh, the, the one I first became acquainted with was when I was writing about advertising. What does the Federal Trade Commission do? Federal Trade Commission, a large part of what it does is to uh, regulate the speech in advertising and, and false advertising um, is not to be permitted. Um, it can be quite dangerous and the government thinks um, or you know, that has an agency that deals with this. So th that that's point one and I, I'll, I'll and get to the second point, which I'm much less sure about. Um, point one, which I feel sure about is we've long had, back to the Sedition Act of 1798, um, uh, legal enactments of the of restrictions on speech. Um, and most of them, I don't think all of them, but most of them are um, valuable and probably necessary. Um, the contemporary expansion of, um, of concerns about free speech, in, including uh, uh, the the limitations on free speech presented often by people on the left um, in the so-called cancel culture. What? Why did those arise? Um, uh, for one thing, they they arose, um, I think, be, because of a virulent right wing. Um, which uh, uses speech to provoke. Bad idea that the teachers use speech to provoke all the time. Um, uh, in order to get a, uh, a thinking response. And um, I, I don't think that's the intent of the, um, of, of the right wing provokers or provocateurs. Um, uh, so, so I, I, I think they intend to embarrass um, uh, and to disrupt. Um, and um, too often, the left uh, obliges um, and uh, res responds in ways that um, are on the surface, certainly, um, in, in violation of free expression. Um, in the long run, are they in violation of free expression? That, that's a question I absolutely have not thought through. Um, and um, would be grateful if you would do some of that for me. You probably have, and I haven't gotten through the whole book. Should I say something? Or um, do you, Richard, do you have? Well, I've got, I've got all kinds of thoughts, but you want to answer your <laughs> second question? I can just oh. say it did anecdote that when I asked mm -hmm. my Columbia undergraduates around 2014 about the cake baker case mm -hmm. where they would come down, and a very strong majority of the students were on the side of the cake baker. So I just would toss that out mm -hmm. as a as a point. Um, but um, yeah, you want to ask your question? Well, I was just yeah. going to make a comment. Yeah. Because based on what Michael was saying, when I was you know thinking about some of these questions. Uh, Father Jordy's discussion of the problem of factions that concerned Madison so much really resonated with me when I think about today's politics and factions for those of you who haven't been reading your um, Madison recently. Uh, he described those as groups of citizens who either, you know, in the form of a minority or a majority are motivated against other citizens by passion or popular concern. He saw freedom of expression and legality as a means to ensuring private rights and the public good. I think one conundrum today is that these modern factions have access to platforms and audiences, and they can claim that they're being canceled when, you know, maybe in fact, it's just um, a social form of rejecting of certain ideas. And that was another thing that I thought Father Jordy really brought out. Um, and I think you may have quoted, 
Glenn Greenwald and some others yes. on that, that we can allow for freedom of expression, but we also have the ability to voice our objection to ideas that we feel are wrong or inappropriate or don't really comport with society's norms. And um, so that's sort of, I, I think, a, a tension uh, right now. Um, yes, uh, Father Jordy, I, I admire the book. I have read it. I've got lots of notes. Um, and in general, I'm in sympathy with what I take to be as your uh, skepticism about called it a libertarian or an absolutist position concerning free expression. So I'm in sympathy. I have a different account of how we got to where we are, and this picks up on Michael's observation. I do not see the United States as uh, founded in a libertarian moment in any modern sense, as you contend, and I do not see a falling away. Um, as you know, because I wrote the article in your journal, I do not see much support for free expression among the Greeks, Socrates, among the Romans, Cicero, uh, with the Catholic Church in the Middle Ages, gave us propaganda and the Inquisition. And in fact, the figures that you highlight are a very selective group of Anglo-American uh, Protestants or people coming out of an Anglo-American Protestant tradition, beginning with Milton, who of course is operating in a world in which free licensing uh, censorship is the norm. John Stuart Mill, who in addition to working for one of the biggest corporations and a burgeoning empire, um, was not a champion of rights, pudiates rights, and in fact contends in On Liberty that only a very teeny sliver of the world's population can ever exist in a world, in, 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 a, in a state is well-educated enough to participate in free expression. That would include, leave out the entire population of Asia, which, which Amartya Sen uh, begs to differ about. And then we get to Holmes, um, he does talk about free trade in ideas, which you quite rightly point out is different from the free marketplace of ideas metaphor that is wrongly considered to be part of the American tradition. And I agree with you there. Talks about fighting faiths, but he's not interested in rights and he's not interested in individuals. He instead, as you know, is interested in a kind of a social norm. So that would that would make him fit more with your tradition. So the shift from, you know, once upon a time we had these values that sustained um, human life, a kind of Patrick Deneen view of the world, and then pluralism and liberals came along and everything sort of went to hell, is not the way I understand the free expression tradition. We've talked about this before on occasion, on many occasions. But just to, to think about a few specific examples to get back to Michael. Congress shall make no law respecting free, free uh, limiting free speech freedom of the press. It's Congress, and this deals with political speech. Uh, the founders of the United States accepted all kinds of restrictions on speech, uh, and journalists were routinely beaten up if they published something that was disliked. Sometimes they go to court, sometimes they didn't. Um, the only example of uh, tyranny of the majority that Tocqueville writes about in a uh, specific example of democracy in America is the murder of a journalist in Baltimore during the War of 1812. So there's a, this was understood. This was not a neutral libertarian project. Anything goes. Uh, all kinds of regulation on morals, all kinds of regulation on conduct, all kinds of regulation on expression. The Jeffersonian tradition was, and you have a footnote on it, but it's not really emphasized, pro-slavery tradition. Uh, the Jeffersonians in the South were perfectly compatible with draconian restrictions, not only on the publication of information on the slavery issue, but also on the discussion of, ish of the slavery issue, and they tried to extend that to the North. So to contend there's a libertarian tradition that is independent of, let's call it, Scottish Enlightenment, uh, common sense philosophy, is I think, uh, is, I think, selling short the American tradition and positing with Deneen and with so many of the theologians coming out of Notre Dame, that there exists some tradition way back there that modernity to at our peril has somehow undermined. In fact, your heroes begin, and I think quite rightly, with the natural rights tradition in the 17th century, which emerges as a response, as you know, better than I do, to the horrific wars of religion. So I, I see free expression as modern. I do not see it as ancient. And I see it as dealing with a set of 
distinctively modern problems, including the legitimacy of the state. Now, having said that, um, I am generally sympathetic to your observations concerning the classroom, as Robert Post has written, and you're we, there, there's a difference between what goes on in the classroom, what goes on in the university, which is not protected under the First Amendment uh, historically, although our colleague Eli Noam wants that to happen and is pushing hard for that to happen at Columbia. Um, there's a difference there between the realm of political expression. And this is the last thing I'll say. We'll get back to more questions. Political expression, by definition, is a means to an end, as Robert Post argued. And in, in a polity, in, in a most basic, and this is what Holmes would have contended, is the perpetuation of the polity. Uh, those fighting faiths are fighting over the Constitution. They're fighting over something shared for Holmes. Free trade and ideas, well, if you talked about anti-monopoly, that emerged at a time when there were all kinds of restrictions on economic activity that Holmes would have understood. So free trade was meant to promote a kind of level playing field. In other words, it occurred within a particular bounded domain. Today, we're in a global information environment. Completely, very different. And the need for uh, regulating, policing, bounding discourse, it seems to me, is a challenge of our own age. And it's a challenge the founders of the United States would have understood well, and that I think the, the, the political leaders all around the world understand. So that is, a, that is a distinct political challenge because of the affordances of internet and digital media. But it is a modern challenge, just as free expression itself, I would contend, is modern. It's not a falling away from some ancient ideal. It's a distinctive response to rise of individual, to the challenge of authority of a, of a, of a hegemonic religious organization, and to opportunities for uh, individual expression that are made possible by uh, widening, uh, possi widening economic circumstances. One just one small thing. Obviously, I mean the public sphere emerges and was born with modernity. Mm -hmm. But my point on rights is that the I mean rights are not given to us by the state; belong to us. Mm -hmm. And this is Michael John points. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael John point that there is no distinction between citizens and the ones that govern. I mean. Um, Rights are not given by the government to us, are ours. And this notion of inalienable rights and this self-governance no, mm -hmm. of the citizens, I think is super strong. And I find it, that's why my admiration for, for the, the tradition of free speech in the US that, I mean, it's multifaceted and it's <laughs> to get a fuller picture. Um, so it's very difficult to see what's free speech in the US because there are many, as we have been mentioning a bit before. No, but just the, the distinction about uh, I totally agree that the public sphere was born with modernity. But I think that the ground of, of our rights is not the creation of a modern state, but us as human beings, we are we have rights that our governors protect. So this is the this is the norm for government is to be there to protect our rights, not to give us rights. Rights are ours. Michael, do you want to chime in on any of the historical stuff? I was thinking at this point we might want to shift to some of the the more modern. Concerns. Well, I, I think that they will mention perhaps that uh, two thirty. Yes, I was. What do we do with what do we do with internet, right? Yes, I was going to go in that direction if you guys are okay with that. Mm -hmm. um, so with the openness of the, the digital ecosystem, we could think that we're living in a sort of a golden age of freedom of expression, but we're really instead living in what's been termed as a free speech recession with societies polarizing around the globe. With authoritarianism, both the analog and digital versions are sort of on the rise. Um, there have been many times in sort of the human history during these periods of technological disruptions where elites have tried to restrict freedom of expression in the name of democracy, in the name of um, public order. And so I guess I kind of wanted to go into this sort of new problem with like, is this just sort of that same response or are we really truly dealing with something that's unique and new and it's going to really require changes in some of our fundamental 
structures and beliefs? Well, um, that, that's the, we used to call it the $64,000. Another question, question. right? <laughs> uh, it should be larger than that. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I, I, I don't have a, a clear answer. I do think um, that that the, the new technologies and um, their distinctive affordances um, uh, create an incredible mess um, for thinking about uh, free speech and expression. Um, uh, Where was I going to take that? That, um, that, that that's in in some sense true of um, all all kinds of social change and prior technological changes also um, have that kind of an impact. And um, part of what's new is is I think I don't know if this relates to monopoly or anti-monopoly, but there's Everything yeah. does. Oh, uh, I forgot. <laughs> yes, I forgot that. Um, that. That there are a handful of extremely powerful and centralized private operators, right. um, and uh, and they've been concerned enough, um, sort of backpedaling, um, to say, "Oh, well, we'll take care of it. Um, we'll have a. We'll get some." Outside experts be our content moderation group, yep. and um, we'll handle it. Don't worry about it. Um, and that's not working, uh, so far as I can tell. Uh, but it's interesting. Uh, it's an interesting development. I mean, there are all kinds of non-governmental um, uh, ventures into regulating speech world. Um, uh, it, one that's been there for forever, uh, I think, uh, is um, uh, small social groups. I mean, f families, first of all, mm -hmm. um, regulate speech. Um, uh, parents with children, occasionally children, well, more than occasionally, children regulating the speech of their parents as social um, forms change and um, uh, and even teaching parents language they're they're uncomfortable with, so it starts there um, uh, with the family, and then the neighbors also regulate speech, right. um, and um, organized groups have also regulated speech, um, um, and and we just call that civil society, I guess, and, uh, a, a whole lot of uh, people for a long time have been interested to um, regulate other people's speech, maybe their own, but um, certainly other people's speech. That's part of um, what schools are supposed to do and so forth. Okay. Um, I, I think part of what's new is, is that the, it, it, yeah, I, I hate to be so supportive, Richard, but but it's the it's the monopoly like um, uh, and near monopoly uh, new modes of communication. We had other powerful modes. Uh, the editors of the New York Times are very powerful um, in shaping today to this day um, right. in shaping what's acceptable speech and what is unacceptable speech they're 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 not unregulated themselves by their audience in particular um and so if they write something about a a, a self-professed nazi in ohio they hear from hundreds or thousands of their readers and say you were too nice to that nazi um and why did you give him so much space in the first place or you went to uh, a, a senator who has wild-eyed views. Why did you give him a, a place on the op-ed page? And and they they hear they hear from um, lots of readers about this. Mm -hmm. That's all within the realm of uh, 
the, the editor can ignore that at some peril um, uh, uh, or respond to it. But um, do we need, we probably need some new tools. I don't know if section 230 is. You well, know, we know it's place. on the block right now. There's four cases before the Supreme Court. And one of the aspects that the court has to kind of figure out is, are there sort of hyster historical parallels to what we're dealing with? And in some of the cases, they have to kind of figure out, well, is content moderation kind of what editors do in a newspaper? Or is the internet really sort of this truly public forum? Um, and then thinking about sort of this virtual public sphere, or public forum, on the one hand, anyone can post just about anything they want and be heard on a global level. On the other hand, public distortion, um, discussion is also distorted by bots and the way information is organized and recommended, which is very much the result of algorithms supporting you know, business models, which maximize revenues and they will often promote salacious content because it brings them money. So is that truly a public sphere? And Richard, you have such a, an incredible history in yeah, sort of I, I telecom mean, and regulation. Yeah. I find the Section 230 debate very strange. Uh, Section 230 was uh, entered into law before Google, before Facebook. It was meant to kind of encourage uh, new sprouts, startups, at the beginning of the internet, and then it's become linked with a kind of libertarian ethos that has basically become a huge uh, economic boon for uh, some of the biggest corporations in the world. So I do not understand the enthusiasm for Section 230 from the, uh, the free, free expression community. I don't think it has much to do with free expression at all or with its history. Having said that, I know there's going to be angry responses about that. But what I will say is that the informational environment in the United States, other countries, always been regulated and there was always a principle of accountability. Mm -hmm. And there is no principle of accountability today. And that absence of accountability has, it seems to me, very clear social costs. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've always subsidized certain kinds of information. We've always uh, disfavored other kinds of information. To contend that there could be such a thing as net neutrality is, is a fantastical idea. Um, I do not understand it. It would not have been understood by the founders of this country who set up information infrastructure, first postal and telegraph and telephone, all regulated, all structured, all supported certain kinds of speech, did not support others. And in each of those networks, there were recourses if you were harmed, even more so in the case of radio and then television. With our own age, we've had a concatenation of forces that have created this presumption that corporations on their own know what's best and that we must empower them even at the serious social cost of our own uh, communities, our own uh, social norms, and indeed perhaps even our own integrity as a nation. I find it very hard to understand. Well, I guess in thinking of some of these um, particular cases mm. that are being discussed right now. There's a couple of issues. Um, the gentlemen that have been given credit for writing Section 230, they um, have put forward briefs to the Supreme Court saying that, because one of the, the main issues is whether or not the systems of recommendation are um, covered or should have some sort of protection under uh, Section 230. And they said that when they wrote it, they sort of envisioned that sort of editorial process, whereas the Justice Department has come out and said they've submitted a brief and they seem to feel that that is um, outside of the original scope of Section 230 because it is a form of, of intervention. It's it's not sort of a, a, a general platform um, passive Mm -hmm. type of activity. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the concerns. I, and mm -hmm. then from the civil society concern, people who are watching this, there's a concern that if the Supreme Court decides that a lot of this activity is, is not given the safe harbor, it's going to force the platforms to have to do proactive monitoring. 
And that is actually right now illegal in, in Europe. So that would be an interjurisdictional problem, um, but it would also then potentially lead to far more online censorship is, is the concern because already they're saying that the AI, which we have to rely on because the scope and scale of all of the communications is so enormous, but to have to put platforms in a situation where to further rely on that um, could actually negatively impact freedom of expression because so much important stuff's yeah, coming down. Neither Father Jordy nor I, if I read this book correctly, <laughs> are opposed to censorship. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So that does not terrify me. Okay. I mean, from a European perspective, yeah. I'm, I'm just yeah surprised looking this contradiction this contradiction in the debate in the US with a tradition that you are in, and you're looking towards Europe, but that's not your tradition. Um, I mean, with the big tech, who is the, who is the, which legal system has, you know, stopped these guys? The European Union with the GDPR, yeah. high fines, and then they adapt and they start doing things well. Because they, I mean, it's interesting, very interesting, um, Google, no? they apologized three times for reading our emails. No? And till, I mean, unless you find them hard, they don't stop doing that. So with privacy issues, and, and I guess that with moderation, that's why with G the GDPR and, the, uh, and now with the new package, new legal package um, that has been enforced a couple of months ago, goes I mean, to tackle these new gate these new gatekeepers. When we read the New York Times, we know who was writing and signing. You were reading the New York Times, or if you are reading or you are listening to Fox, you know who is behind Fox and who is behind New York Times. You can make your judgments as a citizen. The problem with internet, I think, is precisely this mixture, this difficulty of making your own judgments. Precisely because truth and falsehoods are mixed up. Conversations in a bar are mixed with the authority of a, a talented journalist. So we are losing the profession of journalism that we need. We need authority in making news, in telling the truth. Emily Bell's piece of yesterday, you know, The Guardian, saying her, how she fears chatbot. Um, sorry. Um, that GP, GP, GP. Precisely because of this, I mean, what we are losing here is the the link to truth in the profession of journalism, and it looks like technology is going to save us from this, and it's not true. Technology, as Richard and Michael know much better than me, have shaped society uh, in a and transformed society super. I mean, deeply. No, internet is doing it uh, as well. And the resistance to, um, yeah, to establish some norms to these people in Europe, we have it clear: GDPR and <laughs> this new legal package. And but I think in the US, uh, well, let's hope for the best. No? I mean, two just quickly. One, we, we're talking entirely about the United States and Europe, and there are other parts of yeah, the world. That's true. Um, when Zeynep Tefeci came to my class a couple of years ago, she pointed out the only government in the world that has any idea what to do with the internet is China. And that was meant to be startling, meant mm -hmm. to provoke, but it does raise questions about this US Euro um, uh, kind of model that we are we are operating um, under today. So that has other things to say, but let's maybe go to the... Uh, Audience, or you want to? Sure. Yeah. Is there, are there we some, yeah, some well, questions? We have one question yeah. from Fernando Biochetti from Brazil, uh, who is, is a judge oh. and he's one of our big supporters. So thank you for uh -huh. joining. Well, he was uh, uh, talking, he was asking about the um, European Digital Service Act, actually, and wondering whether you would think that it could be considered as a good model. I mean, I think we need to be prudent because. Um, Every single legal tradition has to, you know, it's rooted in a historical tradition and, right. and many things. No? So um, for Europe, 
there's an Ursula von der Leyen and, and the previous um, people in office had clearly in mind that the they, they have coined this expression, technological sovereignty. So they were not happy with people making money in California with people that live in Europe. Okay. So first of all, these guys are moderating the conversation and making money with my people. And I don't see anything. No. So that's not something or the ability of shaping um referendums or elections, no, the Brexit, the Brexit and so forth. So that the alert is, I mean, red flags are absolutely high and they're very tough with this. And Germany with this has, has exercised a leadership that, well, they have been, and Giovanni Buttarelli, no, with a GDPR. So I would say Europe has clear in mind that here we are in a question of sovereignty as well. The model is not clear, I would say, because the, the boundaries, it doesn't work anymore. I mean, the national boundaries don't work. I mean, internet is global. Yep. That's why I think, I mean, I'm with this, I'm probably, I'm naive and to, I don't know, um, but I think it would be the, the occasion to put the best of the European and the American tradition together to uh, set some new boundaries to, uh, yeah, rules um, to play in the internet. But these great tech companies that are not American are global. Right. Yeah, I mean, that is one of the one of the many contributions of your book is to to, to oblige us to think about free expression in a new way that extends before the 17th century and, and includes the Roman law, canon law, and, and also the kind of inspiration such as we can take it from the Greeks. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I think that's right. But it also then raises the question, well, we're in the 21st century and I've got a Marcia Sen in my head suggesting this Western civilization, Western-centric ideas are too narrow for our own age. There's a universal uh, a conception of freedom, universal conception of dignity, democracy. Um, maybe that could be a source. If the corporations are global, if the nature of the problem is global, then maybe the nature of our vision should be global and not European. But I just throw that out as a, as yeah. a provocation. Do you know how much does it cost a picture of child pornography mm. in the internet? Ten dollars. I mean, yes. I don't. I mean, we must fix that. Yes. I mean, there are things that are not. I mean, we cannot. We cannot afford people making big money mm -hmm. and having human mm -hmm. trafficking, child Agreed. pornography going on. Agreed. And come on, I mean, with that, it's over so sophisticated. Um, technologically speaking. You have the statistic, 60% of the videos on the internet is one of your opening videos. Yeah, that's, that comes from, from a book. 60% of videos on the internet are pornography. Right? Isn't that, that was your number? No, it's not mine. I mean, I mean, that's in your book when you cited yeah, yeah. it. Yeah. So then, yeah, this is, I mean, we can say there's a moral panic, you know, we can say, oh, we've had these moral panics before. All right. And maybe there was reason to be concerned, but there's reason to be concerned today. And that's where I that's where I wholeheartedly support your uh, vision. Thank you. I think there's an important distinction there. Some of that content is illegal, and so that falls into one particular category. And so yeah. I think mm -hmm. everyone's in full agreement that that sort of content must be taken down. I think the type of content that's really sort of being debated now is that what they call the awful but lawful <laughs> content. And you know, where do you draw the lines on that? And um, how are we going to go about regulating? What's what's the uh, the appropriate way of doing it? Uh, I think Father Jordi is suggesting, though, it's time to choose. It's time to make a decision. That that's what the argument of your book is. Yes. Um, and uh, going beyond this polarization of reds and blues. Eh? Yeah. I mean, we must build this common ground of civility, and that's why. And I'm saying to go back to who we are, not in a nostalgic way, 
but come on, we have a we share a lot as human beings. I mean, and and that's um, and that's what I think it's valuable. Let, let me I'll say one thing that if we do have more questions. Oh yeah, do we have more questions? Oh, so just to be just to be provocative and troubling. Mm -hmm. Um, we were think we're talking about free expression as if it's an unalloyed good, at least as a norm, and there are problems with it. Um, some years ago, I was reading the great Canadian media theorist, economic historian Harold Innes. Harold Innes was very clear that the free expression tradition in the United States institutionalized monopolies that are threatening the future of the country. And a you know, major influence on Marshall McLuhan, the founder of communication studies taught in the communication pro seminar. I just think there are um, there are issues about free expression if we begin, if we're taking into account the affordances of internet, taking into account the, um, the, the lack of boundedness. Um, that's what troubled Innes at the time of the Second World War. You saw the United States as a nuclear armed hegemon that was emerging with this unassailable ideological vision that was threatening the planet and um i just i have so i would i would even raise that as a as a question free expression is a means to an end robert post has put this very well yes. i think i think you would agree free expression is a means to an end celebration of free expression for its own sake i think is is a is a bad idea and it can lead us in very dangerous directions that, that's also a, a lesson yeah, that's, I take from your book. This symphonic relationship between rights. So Mill rejected rights. So did Holmes. Um, you know, and and so the extent to which the free expression tradition in the United States is grounded on rights is a, is an interesting question, and I think it had much more to do uh, historically with the concern about oppressive religious groups, which is a very important mm -hmm. issue in Federalist Ten. He was concerned about religious, uh, he said religious factionalism could be a cure for the problems caused by uh, the dangers of a, of a hegemonic church. Political faction, Federalist 10, was modeled on religious faction. And one of the great things about the United States was the Protestants could never agree about anything. And quite frankly, there weren't that many Catholics. So therefore, um, smooth sailing because we will not have a single dominant. Now, I don't mean this just to pick on the Catholics, but any dominant cultural tradition here, I'm talking about the United States tradition of free expression, is a potential threat. And so is a corporate libertarianism that we that is so prevalent in the debate over the Um, So I, I, power I, corrupts, absolute corrupt, power corrupts, absolutely. Said by a good Catholic. <laughs> <Lord> <laughs> Uh, the, the post position, I just read that one short paper. This is um, coming out in Daedalus. It's a very interesting essay. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I see it. And yes, okay. um, uh, it, it is a means to an end. But, but free expression is, um, is something you want to protect for the sake of self-realization. Mm. Um, um, which is what well, I don't know what to call that, but it's kind of, a kind of end in itself um, that you want people to be able to participate in in the best of, um, of what human social affairs have to offer. Um, uh, I I don't know if that is a contradiction to to post. Um, uh, but it, you know, but there, there's there's value in free expression as something to protect um, for for the sake of human self development. Quite apart from politics, because we grow through conversations. Right. I I mean, I you I would defer to you, but just that if we think about Aristotle's concept of human flourishing. I don't see Aristotle as a great champion of free expression. I also don't see him as a great champion of self of, of self realization. Well, I he think that's a bit. All right, but I see that as part of the modern, uh, let's call it the modern uh, uh, disease that you are diagnosing, following a long tradition of Catholic theologians, including Patrick Denis. 
So I, I think we can distinguish between self-expression, self-realization, and the good or and yep. human flourishing. And in fact, I think you could argue that the quest for self-realization can damage the quest, the, the project of, of human flourishing. So I, I, I think that there I'm still with Post. And I'm, I'm especially with Post in the distinction between the classroom and the university and the wider public. They're just not the same at all. You, you can permit a Holocaust denier to, to speak in public, but you're not going to hire them. <laughs> um, and, and that's because universities are different. And that gets to this question of what is the relevant domain? Different domains have always policed expressions and they should continue to police. Are there going to be problems? Yes. But the absence of that, you have no governance. You, you are giving yourself up to faceless, nameless groups that have no accountability and that are able to, therefore, um, exercise their will with impunity. And that's dangerous. That's monopoly. So th that would be my pushback on mm -hmm. modernist pride. I mean, this is a, you're defending a modernist position. Yes, Father yes, Jordy is uh, challenging a modernist position. Yeah. And at least that's yeah. that we can argue about that. And that's what. Yeah. One, one friend told me, look, you're not making uh, a lot of friends with this group. <laughs> In the sense that, yeah, I, <laughs> I prize some things, but I also criticize that. So I'm trying to, um, because I think we are in a moment that right. that many things are challenged. And yeah, it's not that we are smarter than anyone in the past, but right. that's why I think we need to we need right. to acknowledge um, that we have been, you know, people that have preceded us that are super smart. And but let me say something else that's very specific. You're a man of the cloth. Clerical Caller, John Durham Peters is a devout Mormon. You've written two of the best books on the challenges of free expression. That I do think that there is a, a secular impulse to glorify the individual, secular impulse to glorify uh, absence of restraint, to challenge, to court the abyss, as John Durham Peters yeah. says in the philosophy, in the very felicitous phrase that he entitles that book that I, I poses real challenges, not only for humanity, but especially for young people. I was having dinner last night with a colleague and, you know, he, he was, when you're of a certain age, you think about your children and they're growing up and he's an intellectual historian. So we're talking about what appeals to young people. There are certain young people today who were from different traditions at Columbia who were drawn by what he called traditional Catholicism. And we were trying to figure out, you know, well, that's interesting. Why is that? Um, because there is a, there's a need, a human need for boundaries. There's a human need for some for being told not only what to do but what not to do, and maybe having models of what to do and not to do. Religious institutions have provided those models and those norms. Um, that social society. I mean, civil yeah. society that was that was talking Michael about. I mean, mm -hmm. family. No, I mean yeah. this. These small social structures that is where you uh, learn how to distinguish between good and evil. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't want a corporation that's that is making money to teach my people. Mm -hmm. Correct. Um, that's why I think that we need to, you know, get it well, get it right. <laughs> <laughs> TikTok, it's very educative. No, it's a new, right. it's another sort of classroom. Right. So. So, and it's there's no way back eh, with the evolution of technology. Point is, the boundaries that are not only legal. I think it's but not always worse. Printing press, Protestant Reformation were a net plus for free expression yeah. in my book. And then, in fact, your examples are all drawn from figures. I mean, starting with Milton, he's trying to get his book published. <laughs> so we can get divorced. <laughs> <laughs> so there you have it in a nutshell. Well, so much of this does come down to who's going to be the one who's going to regulate the conversation and to bring the norms somehow into the public sphere or into the, the online world. And I think the Supreme Court is going to make some very important decisions as to whether or not the state will now reclaim the ability to to regulate the platforms and what will that look like? We had a conversation in October at a conference. We had a lot of technologists that we brought together and they were talking about the problem 
of how it can technology start to build into the structures certain in positive incentives for better behavior. And they gave some very, very interesting examples of how that might be able to be done. But I think that there are um, different companies and engineers that are starting to take human rights values into concern in the design because they're recognizing that there are a lot of negative incentives that are building this, this type of behavior. And now there's a trend to try to find a way of reducing the power of the platforms and returning a lot of that power to the user because that was the original idea behind the internet. And that can come in the way of um, allowing individuals to have control over their content moderation themselves. And so it's complicated to make that work right because yeah. there's a lot of challenges to it. Um, but I think that any sort of solution is going to have to be a multifaceted one. Clearly legal solutions aren't enough um, and technology is gonna have to play a role, uh, but we do have a cultural uh, problem right now on our hands. Absolutely. And this is a book about, I mean, yeah. fundamentally it's about that cultural problem. Yeah. That, that's what this book is about. Well, thank you. Everyone, I think we've sort of reached time. Are there any last questions? No, no, there isn't. Mm -hmm. well, the audience open to on site from the PhD candidates. Yeah. Well, almost <laughs> doctoral, almost, almost doctors. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to thank you all so much for joining us today, everybody online as well. And a huge thanks to Father Jordan. We're so happy to have you back at Columbia. And to actually be able to read the fruits of all of your work and the discussions that we had long ago. So we're looking forward to your work on transparency. That's coming soon. Well, maybe not so soon. <laughs> but um, thank you all again for joining us today. It's been very inspired by your, I mean, that's it's a bill of rights. Yes, um, you got it. Yeah. Um, okay.